Good morning. Welcome to Main Street Presbyterian Church. We are delighted to have you joining us for our morning worship service. This is week nine in our video recordings. And I know many of us are growing impatient. We're ready to resume uh, our church meetings. And I would just ask and urge you to be patient. The Governor's Safer at Home order was extended through May 25th. And on May 25th, we are hoping, hoping and praying that uh, we'll be allowed to meet again in person in our church for worship. And I, I would ask that you pray to that end. I want you to remember uh, some people in need in the congregation. Please remember Brad Talley. He entered hospice care uh, on Wednesday and uh, just ask that you would pray for him and for Alice and for their children and grandchildren uh, as they enter this, this season of his last few days and weeks of life. We want to also mourn with those who mourn as we uh, grieve alongside of Bertram and Debbie Jenkins who uh, lost their son-in-law, Keith Cole, he passed into glory uh, on Wednesday morning. We also want to rejoice with those who rejoice. We praise God for the safe delivery of Eleanor Grace Singletary. We rejoice with the Singletary family in this, uh, this new covenant child. Let us now turn our attention to worship. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 65 verses one to four. David, the sweet psalmist of Israel writes, praise is due to you, O God, in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you shall all flesh come. When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. We're going to join together in singing our opening hymn, All People That On Earth Do Dwell. The words will be printed on your screen. Join with us in singing. join with me in prayer. Father, we come before you to worship you this day, this Sabbath day, this day of rest. We pray that uh, you would be the center point and the focus of our attention, that we would reflect upon your goodness to us, 
and we would give you thanks, that we would understand that we are creatures dependent upon you for all things, and that we would seek you and walk in faith with you each day of our lives. We pray that we would seek you for strength in uh, assisting us with our various needs, whether they are um, sin struggles that we're having, financial difficulties, relationship struggles, whatever uh, may be causing us difficulties and trials in our lives, let us seek your assistance. Our Lord and our God, we pray that you would lift our hearts to you this day, that you would enable us to freely worship you, that your spirit would guide us and lead us, that you would speak to us through the reading and preaching of your word, that you would lift our hearts through the singing of hymns, that you would drive us to the throne of grace through the prayers of your people. And we ask, O oh Lord, through the means of grace that you would strengthen us and that you would cause us to grow to maturity in Christ. We pray this for the glory of our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our reading of the law comes from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. The Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writes, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In response to the reading of God's law, let us join together collectively and confess our sins. O oh Lord, merciful Father, forgive us that we have not put to death what is earthly in us, we are plagued by sexual immorality, impurity, passions, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, we deserve your coming wrath. We confess that we walk in anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk, and so give in to the practices of our old selves. O oh Lord, deliver us from the dominion of darkness and transfer us into the kingdom of your beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Help us to seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. By the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to put on the new self in compassion, kindness, 
humility, meekness, patience, forgiveness, and above all, love. May the peace of Christ rule in our hearts and the word of Christ dwell in us richly and all for his glory. Amen. As we examine our hearts before God and before one another, we humble ourselves confessing our sin, but we do that not without hope, but so that we can experience more of the riches and the glory of gospel grace. I want you to hear these words written from King David in Psalm 32. And my prayer is that they bring great encouragement to you and that they are sweet in your ears. David writes, after his great confession of sin with Bathsheba, these words, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. Righteous is the one who seeks his righteousness, not in the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. We are the righteous ones through the glorious grace, gospel grace of Christ. May you hear these words and may they encourage your heart. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn of response to this glorious good news of God's mercy. We're going to sing, My Worth is Not in What I Own. The words are printed on your screen. <laughs>
please join with me as we go to our Lord in prayer. God, our Father, we come to you tonight as your people. You are the only true God, the only God that has the power to be able to help us and the love to be willing to help us. We know that you are God and that all that is, is because of you. We know that you and you alone have the power to order the universe and to keep it moving along its ordered path. You breathed life into our being and you have continued to abide in us. Lord, we thank you for your grace in allowing us to come to you in our times of need and in our times of plenty. We acknowledge that all we have comes from you and we're thankful that everything you give us or send our way is ultimately for our own good. Lord, you have promised us that all things work together for good for those who serve you and we are again grateful that you have the power to keep that promise. Lord, we're living in difficult times, and in times like these, it is sometimes difficult for us to remember and to trust in your promises. We look around, we see the sickness and death of so many across our country and our world, and we see the economic and emotional toll and hardship that this pandemic has brought to all of us. Lord, in the midst of times like these, we must be people who live in reality. Help us to remember that our reality is your people is the care of a loving God who is continually working all things together for our good. Lord, we thank you for that truth. Lord, we rejoice today with Kyle and Katie Singletary in the birth of their daughter, Nora. We pray for your grace for their family as they make this happy adjustment. And we pray that you will draw Nora to you at an early age. However, at the same time, Lord, we grieve with Bertram and Debbie Jenkins in the death of their son-in-law, Keith Cole. Father, we pray that you will uphold them along with Monica and Michael as they mourn their loss. Father, we also lift up Brad Talley and Alice and their family as Brad has, has moved into what might be the final stages of his battle with cancer. Lord, we pray for comfort for him and for his family and we thank you for the blessing that Brad has been to our church for these years. Lord, we pray for our country and her leaders these men and women are being called upon to make impossibly hard choices and decisions about a situation with which no one has any experience. Lord, we pray that you will use this crisis to help people understand their need for you, not just as someone who can help them through hard times and with hard decisions, but as someone who can save them from their very real and damning sins. We pray for strength for our healthcare professionals, for our military, and for ordinary men and women who have been called upon to do extraordinary things in this strange time. Again, Father, we all pray for peace and for strength and for wisdom. Lord, we pray for our church in these times when we can't come together to worship. We pray that you will put a special burden on our hearts to give generously to our church. Lord, you have blessed us so much in this regard, and we pray for your continued grace to uphold our church, not only financially, but also emotionally. And we pray that this time we have been forced to be a part will give us a renewed excitement for working in the programs of the church when we're able to meet together again. Lord, finally, today we ask your blessings on Todd as he comes and brings your word to us. We look so forward to the time when we can be together as a congregation worshiping you. But for now, we remain so thankful for this means that you have supplied us with for worship. Father, speak through Todd today and give him the words that you would have us to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we continue to explore the life of David, we're going to mix in a couple of, um, of, of the more famous Davidic psalms today. We're going to look at Psalm 23. Maybe one of the, the most well-known passages in, in all of Scripture. Um, if you will open your copy of God's Word, I'll read Psalm 23. David writes, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Life in a fallen, sinful, corrupt world is difficult. People can be cruel. Our circumstances are challenging, whether it be in relation to financial difficulties, relationship, relational hardships, health complications. Our hearts are corrupt. We fail morally at times. We chase after the things of the world. We sin. How do we cope under such difficult circumstances? What keeps us from throwing in the towel and giving up? David's world was no different. He experienced unjust treatment, for instance, in his relationship with Saul who despised him without cause, was jealous over a man who simply sought to serve him. David, in his own life, even though he was a man who pursued righteousness, he also experienced great moral failure. He had unholy conduct. He committed adultery. He tried to cover it up by murder. Uh, He lied at times. He also had a dysfunctional family. Within his own family experience, there was incest, rebellion, and murder. How did this man manage? Well, one of the great sources of his strength was his perspective on life. He believed that as he walked with God through all of those life experiences, God was with him. God was and is and continues to be his shepherd. Our comfort in life comes from knowing that the Lord is constantly watching over us like a shepherd watches over his flock. You remember Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. He is our shepherd and we are his sheep. I think this this thought which is expressed in Psalm 23 is summed up very well by the Heidelberg Catechism question one. That question is this, what is your only comfort in life and in death? The answer, that I, with body and soul, both in life and in death, am not my own, but belong to my faithful Savior Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood has fully satisfied for all of my sins and redeemed me from all the power of the devil and so preserves me that without the will of my Father in heaven, not a hair can fall from my head. Yes, that all things must work together for my salvation. Wherefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready and makes me heartily willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. Beautiful summary of what David is trying to express to us in Psalm 23. As we study the Psalm, we're gonna look at it under three headings. First, the good shepherd's presence. Second, the good shepherd's shepherd's provision. And then third, the good shepherd's protection. First, the good shepherd's presence. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. David is in the the midst of a difficult time, or he's reflecting upon the difficulties that he experienced in his life. He describes it as as walking with God through the valley of the shadow of death. I don't know if it gets any more darker and difficult than 
what that language images in our mind. There are times in David's life where his enemies were making things extremely difficult for him. We've talked a lot about Saul, uh, the first king of Israel. David loyally served him, and yet Saul betrays him, turns on him, returns good with evil, places David's life in jeopardy. Later in his life, after he had been established as a king, he's in his older age, uh, you would think that he would be experiencing peace and comfort, but the Lord brings another trial, uh, a more um, emotional trial to his life. His own son, Absalom, rebels against him. He's, during that same time, his, he's betrayed by one of his chief governmental counselors, Ahithophel. He's exploited uh, by a person that he helped, a man by the name of Ziba, uh, a servant of Mephibosheth. His world is just exploding all around him. And he thinks back upon these trials, these deep, dark periods in his life and remembers that God is with him. The temptation in times like this, and I know we've all experienced it, when we get into great difficulties, when we feel as if everything is working against us, we're in the valley of the shadow of death, the temptation is to feel that we're all alone and that God is angry with us and God has abandoned us. And we need Psalms like this to remind us that that's not true. David reveals to us, and he sets a pattern before us of how we're to conduct ourselves in times like this. We need a God-centered outlook on life. Our feelings of abandonment or of God's anger need to be overruled by our faith. David says that the Lord is his shepherd that the Lord is with him, that even though he's walking, even though it's a contrasting statement, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. That's the key. We have to stir up our faith. What is the reality that God is with us, that he is a shepherd to us, that he will never leave us nor forsake us. He is committed through a covenant purchased by his own blood for our well-being. He loves us. We need to stir up our faith. We need to stand fast, to stand firm in our faith. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus, especially in the hard times of our lives, when we are being brought through the valley of the shadow of death, as Psalm 23 describes it. Reminds me uh, of Peter. You remember when Peter is walking, he sees Jesus walking on water and he gets out of the boat and he begins to walk on the water as well. As long as his attention is fixed, his faith is fixed on Jesus, he's fine. Even though he's in a very dangerous situation. But when he begins to fixate his mind and his attention on his circumstances, he begins to sink. He begins to panic. He needs to focus on Christ. And that's what, that's what David is teaching us here. God is always with his children, especially in difficult times. His faith is being stirred up in this psalm as he reflects on God's, his experiences with God. And he's focused on the Lord, the great God of Israel, the shepherd of the people, the children of God. This shepherd gives his life for his sheep. 
His life is ruled by caring for, protecting, guarding, governing the people of God. David knew this firsthand because he was a shepherd. He did this with his own life. He gave his own, uh, he dedicated himself to the care of his father's sheep. So it was uh, imagery that was very personal to, to David. He knows that the Lord is with him that the Lord is present, that the Lord is active on his behalf. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. Do you believe that? Do you own that promise? Do you believe that the God of the universe, through his son, Jesus Christ, shepherds you? The Lord of the universe created us in his image because he delights to be with us. He delights to welcome and to receive us into his presence. The whole idea and concept of the tabernacle in the Old Testament expresses that God wants Israel to be with him in his symbolic presence, the tabernacle. But it's chiefly expressed in the incarnation of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. In John chapter 1, verse 14, we read this, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The shepherd, the chief, the good shepherd, took on flesh so that he could be with his people always. David is reminding us that we need to live our lives grasping a hold of the, the, the promise that the divine is present with us through all of it. It's the nature of the covenantal relationship. God says, I will be your God and you will be my people. God binds himself in covenant as a shepherd over us. That is heartwarming and encouraging if we grasp it by faith. So David reminds us in this Psalm that God, that the good shepherd is present. The second thing is that the good shepherd provides. He reminds us of the good shepherd's provision. How does the Lord conduct this work of shepherding? Well, the characteristics of a good shepherd are that they feed and and water their flock. They heal the lame and the wounded. They seek those that are wandering astray. The interests of the flock consume the mind and the heart of the shepherd. The Lord provides for his sheep. David says, the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord's my shepherd, I lack nothing. I have everything I need. I am complete and full in the Lord. He gives his shepherd, or his sheep, the the Lord gives his sheep rest. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He gives David spiritual and physical rest. Rest from the works of the law. We read earlier in the service from Psalm 32, blessed is the man, David writes, whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. He gives us rest from the burden of a legal righteousness, a law-based moral righteousness. He gives us rest from God's wrath. 
by taking it upon himself. He's the good shepherd. He lays down his life for the sheep. He provides us, as Paul says, with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. We've got a brother in this church, Brad Talley, who is literally walking through the valley of the shadow of death in his battle with cancer. But Brad has everything. Brad has all spiritual blessings in Christ. Brad has rest. And it doesn't matter where we are in our life, what our circumstances are, David is teaching us we are full. We lack nothing. Everything is provided for us. The Lord seeks comfort for his sheep. He feeds them on the best and the most beautiful of land. They drink from the calm waters, the still waters. The Lord has our best interest in mind. The devil wants us not to believe that. The devil wants to whisper into our mind thoughts that are opposed to that, but God in the gospel speaks clearly that he is for us, that he loves us. David says, he, leads, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Reminds us of Psalm 51, where David falls into grave sin with Bathsheba. His, and you know this, when you fall into sin, it pains us. There is, there is a, a spiritual grieving that goes on. We do not like ourselves in those circumstances. And David says, create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. His soul is restored. And that's the goal of the new covenant that God has made with us. If we read in Ezekiel chapter 36, God writes this after he has been very patient with Israel and they continue to break covenant, they continue to wander. They're, they're these sheep that are wandering and he's constantly bringing them back and chastening them. And he writes in Ezekiel 36, verse 23, and I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations by my sheep. How is he going to do that? He's going to restore their soul. Verse 25. He writes this, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, uncleanliness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from you, from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. He restores us. He leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, for his glory's sake. We must know that the Lord seeks our good he constantly watches over us for this purpose. We know, says the Apostle Paul, that all things work together for the good of those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. The third point, the good shepherd's protection. The good shepherd protects his flock. It's a difficult journey. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. If you think about sheep, 
Uh, when I lived in Wales, if you drove out into the countryside, <coughs> sheep were just wandering. Uh, they didn't have fences to protect them. They had spray paint uh, to mark them apart from other farmers' sheep. But they roamed pretty much wherever they wanted in the countryside. But sheep are either followers or wanderers. They willingly submit to the shepherd or they wander aimlessly when they have no shepherd guiding them. Our shepherd, our chief shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, leads us through the valley of the shadow of death. It wasn't unexpected. He's bringing us to that point. David acknowledges that his trials, his difficulties, are overruled, supervised, guided by the providential hand of God. God leads him into the valley of the shadow of death. But he leads with his rod and his staff the tools to protect us when we are vulnerable, when the, the wild animals seek to take our lives. God has chosen a path full of danger to lead us. In the story of David and, and the rebellion of his son Absalom later in his, in his rule, um, he's, as Absalom is starting the rebellion, David is leaving the city of Jerusalem. Absalom is starting to take power momentarily. David is, is fleeing for his life again, fleeing and escaping from his own son. It's a bitter, bitter situation. Can't imagine it. But as he's fleeing the city of Jerusalem, he's, he's met by a man named Shammai. And Shammai is a descendant of Saul. And as David, this, this glorious and accomplished king, is fleeing the city, this man Shammai curses him and uh, hurls stones at David. And David's servants who are surrounding him, his entourage, they're ready to, to take out swords and put this man to death. And it's interesting how David handles the situation. David doesn't allow his servants to harm Shammai, stating that the Lord, who he says in Psalm 23 is his shepherd, who brings him into these difficult situations, ordered him to curse him and to throw stones at him. That's a, a perspective, a faith-based perspective on life. How do you look at your life? How do you look at the Shemais that come into your life? Do you see them as appointed by God? It's hard to do that sometimes. David writes this, Behold, my own son seeks my life how much more now may this Benjaminite leave him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. This is a necessary journey that the Lord brings all of his children on. He even brought his son into the valley of the shadow of death. David speaks early in the song of God's lavish provisions for him, giving him rest and providing everything for him. But when we're in positions of, of great blessing, from a, a worldly perspective on that, uh, when all of our needs are met and we're, we're comfortable, there is a danger of forgetting God and looking to ourself. In Deuteronomy 6, towards the end of that chapter, the Lord promised Israel a, a blessed land, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of great abundance. But he warns them, after partaking of this bountiful land, he warns them to beware, lest they forget the Lord who brought them out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. So oftentimes, in the wisdom, profound wisdom of God, it's in the valley 
of the shadow of death that our self-dependence, our trust and love for the world is taken away. And we learn to trust and depend on God. He's molding us and shaping us. He's refining us through difficult times. Blessings or comfort or worldly and material things often breed pride in our sinful hearts. In Deuteronomy 8, beginning in verse 11, Moses says this to the Israelites, Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes which I, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply, and your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God. The valley of the shadow of death humbles us, reminds us of who we are. We're creatures, not the Creator. God desires that humble and contrite heart. And because of some of the hard things in David's life, David developed a humble and a contrite spirit, which the Lord rejoiced in more than his offerings and sacrifices. These experiences in David's life taught his heart to cling to God. Situations that produce fear, whether it's our deathbed or some other time of great difficulty, they sharpen our focus. They remove a lot of the distractions that surround us most of the time. They keep us laser sharp in our trust in the Lord. When the shepherd leads us through the valley of the shadow of death, we seek after his rod and his staff to guide us. David is exercising great faith here. He's reminding himself of God's covenant promises to be his protector. He is fully resting in the wise loving providence of God. He's not complaining. He's not bucking under it. And what's the ultimate end? Verses 5 and 6. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The sheep don't know the end of the journey. God does. And this is the end of the journey. Why is he bringing him through the valley of the shadow of death? So he can give him everything. So that, so that David can dwell in the presence of the Lord forever. The end is victory and blessing. God vindicates David in the presence of his enemies. Maybe he's referring to Saul and Absalom here. He showers his children with blessings. Look at verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What's the end goal of the shepherd? Why is he leading us where he leads us in life? He's preparing us for eternity, which is with him, dwelling in his presence forever. That's what our good shepherd has in store for us. It is a sweet and a precious promise. Let us rejoice in it. We're going to conclude our service by singing, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Please join in lifting your hearts to the Lord as we conclude. <laughs>
Let us conclude with our benediction. Now, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you for everything good that you may do, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we conclude our service today, we're going to sing our concluding hymn. I don't even know what it is, so we're going to have to redo this. It was three ninety nine, right? You're going to have to splice that in. What? Save your life. <laughs> You're ready? Okay. Now we're ready. <laughs> okay. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. You're throwing them off. <laughs> Some good outtake material today. I know I should be singing. Good one, man. Close with our benediction from Hebrews 13, beginning in verse 20. Now, may the God of peace, who brought us again from the dead, redo that. Let us when we pray.